Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Forty Orty Podcast. It is the twentieth episode, the big two zero. I am very happy to have someone on who is a very amazing person. We're going to be talking about neurodiversity today, and the reason why I've invited my new guest on is because I recently got into audiobooks, and I was looking for audiobooks around autism. And one of the things that sort of popped up in my feed was a book called Spectrum Girls Survival Guide: How to Grow Up Awesome and Autistic, and I found it a really good read. So today I've got Sienna Castell on. I hope I said that right on the podcast. How are you doing, Sienna? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? I'm all right. As as we sort of uh, said in in our pre chat, I am struggling to get out of bed these uh, couple of Few couple of days, so it's it's nice to have something to something exciting to get up to. Just for anybody out there, Sienna is a multi award winning autism advocate and anti bullying campaigner. She's founder of the Quantum Leap Mentoring, a peer mentoring service for people with autism and learning differences. She's also author of the Spectrum Girls Survival Guide, as I've said. And creator of the Neurodiversity Celebration Week, which is absolutely amazing. And how how old are you, Sienna? I'm seventeen. Wow! So you've already done quite a lot of good work, and you haven't even reached your twenties yet. It's very exciting. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about your sort of journey within all the work that you do and the media stuff? Yeah. So.、Um... I'm autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, and I also have ADHD. And when I was at school, I was bullied a lot for my learning differences.、Um, I was misunderstood by teachers.、Um, I ended up going to, I think, eleven schools.、Um, it was really difficult for me, and I constantly felt misunderstood and kind of alone in my experience. I would、mm-hmm. join schools and have classmates tell me. I've only been to two schools in my whole life: my primary school and then this secondary school. And then I'd sit there and be like, "Oh yeah, my record is three schools in one year." And I just felt like everyone had a really easy path, and it was just kind of me struggling through secondary school and being alone in it.、Mm-hmm. And then when I was twelve, I was diagnosed with autism, and I went online and I read about it, and I read about、um, the stories of girls who are autistic. And I found that I'm actually not alone at all in my struggle. Like a lot of people actually have it worse than me, and you know, have been kicked out of mainstream school, and their parents are being forced to homeschool them. And it's a very common story within the community. When I learned that, it was just a feeling of relief for me because I didn't feel so alone, and I felt like actually there's a community of people who are like me.、Mm-hmm. And so from that day on, I kind of wanted people. Um, not just autistic people, but people with learning differences in general, to know that they're not alone.、Um, that lots of people are going through what they're going through, and it kind of inspired me to start my QR mentoring website when I was thirteen. I found that there were a lot of resources online, but they were kind of directed at the parents.、Um, I would go online, and it would be like. How to comfort your child who has who's being bullied and is autistic, and it would be like tell them this, and I just didn't know how to apply that to my life. Yeah, because like, do I just tell myself that advice as if I'm the parent of an autistic child? Like, it's hard to apply, and so I decided to start my website with the focus of just giving advice to kids with learning differences. That's brilliant. I think when you, when you get your autism diagnosis and you find that sort of community of people. 
I think for, for me, the, the biggest sort of change or, or um, good thing or positive thing that came out of that was that I stopped comparing myself to most people and started sort of developing a new standard for how well I should be doing or, or the type of skills that I had. I think, you know, sometimes you can get sort of frustrated at yourself if you're having a bad day sensory wise and, and all of that. And it can be quite hard to treat yourself with kindness. And I think the autism diagnosis allowed me to treat myself with kindness. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. Like I went through, um, I had really low self-esteem and I was constantly wondering, you know, what was wrong with me, why I couldn't understand these social situations and why I was constantly getting bullied. And I would spend hours like on watching TV and trying to like mimic different body mm. language and mimic like conversations. And I'd even script conversations. And the whole time it was just like, I shouldn't have to do this. Nobody else is doing this. Everyone else is able to do it naturally. And I'm having to fake it. And it, it gave me a lot of self-esteem problems. But after I was diagnosed, I just felt like, yeah, this is something that a lot of people do who are autistic. It's not as weird as I initially made it out to be. And it's, it's fine. It's just my way of coping. I think it, it can definitely feel like you're the alien in a lot of situations. But could you tell us a little bit more about sort of your, your experiences, like with the media, like with your um, awards and stuff like that? Because I'm quite interested to know about those. Yeah, so I've been doing my neurodiversity work for um, four years now. And each year, my kind of relationship with media has completely changed. Like the first year I started doing it, after I set up my website, I made a few contacts and I started being invited to give speeches. And I remember the first speech I gave, it was really, really, really big deal. I remember I had to go out and I had to pick the right dress to wear. And it's very difficult when you're autistic to find the right dress to wear because it has to be the right fabric. and and then it also has to like go with the event and it was such a process. And I remember it took the whole day <laughs> and then we had to drive into the middle of nowhere. Like I, I still can't remember where it was. I just remember it was like, I think a seven hour drive and we had to like stay at a hotel and my mom took me there and we show up to this event and I think I'm going to like pass out. I'm so nervous and my heart is beating so fast and there are literally three people in the room Oh, and including my mom. Mm. And and she's there like supporting me and I give my speech and I remember um, because I'm dyslexic, sometimes I skip lines when I read Yeah, and I like skip words as well. And I remember like I've never read anything as badly as I read that first speech. <laughs> it, was like, it was like I didn't know how to read. Like, And then I would be like, oh wait, I'm going to restart this. Mm. And so I'd restart it and I'd make a mistake and I'd be like, I'm just going to say it really confidently like I meant to make that mistake. And I thought that would work out for me, but it just made it sound like I didn't know how to speak English, kind of. It was so <laughs> cringeworthy and so embarrassing. But that was my first kind of experience in, in like media and doing like speeches and going to like a public event like that. And slowly it started to build up. And the biggest one I've ever done is when I did the BBC Teen Hero Award. Mm, I've heard of that. It was like an insane event for me. I was so grateful to have to be a teen hero and we got to meet Kate and William oh. and there were all these kind of there were all these like different people who did like morning shows and t different tv shows and they all met with us and I got to like talk to Kate and that was incredibly nerve-wracking somehow it wasn't <laughs> as nerve-wracking as that first media event I did but it was up there because she like knew my name and she was talking to me and I remember just thinking, like, just remember the name of your website. And I thought that I was going to end up forgetting that. I was just so starstruck. And I'm like, you've just got to remember your website and you've got to remember your different campaigns. And that was a great experience. And then we got to go on stage to collect the award. Mm. That was in front of 10,000 people who were there. Wow. And then there were people watching it live on TV. Wow. And I think there were like 3 million people watching it live. Whoa. <laughs> and I was it was so nerve wracking. I mean it was a big it was a big difference between like the first event I did, which was like three people, including my mom, and then this one, which was like three million people. Yeah. And it was so nerve wracking. I was the last to go up out of the teen heroes and 
what they did was they put us in a kind of trap door Mm -hmm. that would then come up. And so I was in this small room to begin with, (laughs) and it was kind of like dark and very sensory processing disorder friendly. Like there were there was nothing bright in there because you'd be able to see it. I'm sort of picturing like a like a Hunger Games sort of style thing. You know, when they sort they they stand on those platforms and then get raised up. Is that the kind of thing that that happened? Or? Yeah, it like <sighs> it felt just like that. You had that same emotion because you're just so terrified of what's about to go down, and you know that if you make a mistake, like it's gonna either become like a viral joke or it's gonna end your career. And so you're like, okay, you've got to, you've got to make this work. <laughs> and so I climbed into this little trapdoor thing, still inside a very kind of like sensory processing disorder space. And then all of a sudden it fills with like this um, dry ice kind of thing uh... so that you can't see the mechanisms underneath. It's like an effect that they do. And they slowly start pulling you up. And then you just hear like the, the sound of the crowd who are like clapping. And then these bright stage lights turn on. And it all of a sudden goes into the most autism, unfriendly thing ever. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. But it, it was such a shock to the system. I've never had like, oh, a really friendly, calming space. And then all of a sudden, your worst mm-hmm. nightmare. Like the lights were so bright. And they were kind of strobing as well. And I'm like, oh, my God. Definitely like a hot to cold moment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was... It was a real shock to the system. And I think that that was partly why I was able to pull it off because I just, I was in so much shock that I couldn't quite panic. Yeah. I remember I just forgot everything I was going to say. And I was walking up to them to collect my award. I'd just forgotten everything. And I had to make it up on the spot. I was actually really proud of the way I handled it. I talked about like kindness and anti-bullying and acceptance and the words I use, I still kind of use on my website. Mm-hmm. And I remember stepping off that stage and being like, you know, I, I think I did it. I did a good job. I'm proud of how far I've come. Like that was a really big bump. I was like, I went from three people to like three million people and it worked out. And it, it just kind of showed my journey. And I was really grateful to have been given that opportunity. That is a very good story. <laughs> oh, like. I empathize to to a, a small extent. I um I've done I think maybe two two or three sort of speaking events. The first was like this what was it called? The Sunday Assembly in Manchester. It was like quite quite a small event with probably about 30 people in it. And uh, I did that with one of the uh, BBC freelancers called Louise Crooms. And that that was sort of a nice introduction. I was invited to go to a special needs school to sort of give a, a talk on sort of sport and, and tell them a story about my taekwondo journey and all of that. And <laughs> I tried to write a script and I am notoriously bad at sticking to scripts. Like I'm, I'm much better just speaking my mind, but you can't really do that when you've got like a set amount of time. So it was, I definitely did stumble over my words a lot and it was, quite frightening even at that scale and it wasn't even recorded so it was <laughs> i can't imagine what that would feel for you crazy but well done thanks it's just it's it's been a journey and the more speaking engagements you do the more kind of confident you get in it just because you feel like you've done it before and it got to a point for me where i was giving very similar speeches um, like when you're talking about neurodiversity and the work that I do, mm-hmm. like there are oh, oh so many ways that you can describe how you started a website. Yeah. At a certain point, when you're giving your speeches, it's you you can pick apart bits that you've you've already said a hundred times before, and so you get a kind of confidence to it. Yeah, I get that. It's like um, repeating your story, isn't it? It's just like. <sighs> I do I do think like when I do go on to like other people's podcasts and stuff I do have like what you'd say like a a stick like something that I say a lot I my, my girlfriend does pick up on that quite a lot like she say it's like you always start these interviews saying the same thing I'm like yeah I know I always tell a story about going to McDonald's and getting chicken nuggets and being told that I was autistic I know <laughs> so yeah I, I get that oh actually there's one, one thing that I wanted to ask you. You have met Lana Del Rey. 
I didn't meet her, but she did a video for me, like a recording, and she was like, oh, hi, Sienna, congratulations on the Teen Hero Award. Wow. Which was amazing. It was amazing. Um, Sean Mendes also did a video for me, and I remember everyone would be like, aren't you excited that Sean Mendes did a video? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm excited that Lana Del Rey did a video, <laughs> because I've been a fan of hers for forever. I still play her Born to Die album at least once a day. Um, my thing is with my sensory processing issues, mm -hmm. I often listen to music to calm myself. It's just, I used to stem, but then when that, when people stressed that that wasn't socially acceptable and I was kind of forced out of it, I used music as my crutch and like I would, whenever I go on public transport, I'm always listening to music. And whenever I have big kind of bullying or stressful events in my life, I spend maybe like 60% of my day just listening to music. And a lot of her albums got me through like really tough times. I, I definitely use music as sort of like an emotional crutch as well. It's, it, it definitely helps me cope with stuff. I do like to listen to sort of upbeat stuff, but I think there's a time and a place. Most of the stuff that I listen to is kind of sort of downbeat and relaxing. And I agree with you. Like some of her songs are like, they're, they're so chill, but... Lana is definitely one of my favourite musicians, and it's not often that I sort of listen to. Would you would you consider to be her to be like pop music? She's, um, I think she's alternative, but like mm. summertime sadness definitely did have a kind of pop to it. Well, yeah, they did like a like a dance track to it and stuff, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, the Cedric one. Mm. But uh, yeah, that that was one thing that I sort of picked up. I think you, I think you might have mentioned it on a live stream that I joined in on or it was uh, no it was your book I think you talked about it a little bit in your book I remember but I'm, I'm very jealous very jealous of that <laughs> I think she's awesome but that's really interesting you've done a lot with your life so far and I think you've done a lot of good thank you could you tell us a little bit about sort of how the the mentoring website works like do you have any like stories of, of people who have benefited from your service yeah so um when i first started my website um i started just putting little articles on there and it's stuff like you know how to keep organized when you have dyspraxia you know tips with girls who are autistic and just school organization things and I also have a page where you can contact me and I have my email and so people started sending me different emails and, and, and you know talking about their experience some of them were parents and they were just saying you know I'm having this really difficult time my daughter has read your website and has applied all of the tricks that you've given and it's not really making an impact because no matter what we what we try to do to help her confidence and help her esteem, she's still getting bullied at school. And like we have mm. to just kind of address that first. And there was stuff like, you know, you have all these tips about, you know, how to keep yourself organized and how to do well at school, but it's really hard to apply them when you have a teacher who is discriminatory. Yeah. And the more emails I got, the more I was like, you know, I need to do something and I, I need to try to change this because it's not enough to just have autistic people feel confident in themselves and know how to support themselves you also need the people who are spending the majority of the day with them like when you're at school it's like eight hours to be supportive as well yes. and so I started my neurodiversity celebration week program with that in mind so my neurodiversity celebration week program it has three aims to educate neurotypical classmates and peers about learning differences, to educate teachers about learning differences, and then to empower children with learning differences. And I do that by just having um, different activities on my website and different kind of like assembly ideas and posters that you can put up around the school that have inspirational people who have learning differences and so you can look at it and be like oh you know emma watson's incredibly successful and she's got a learning difference mm. it's not gonna hinder my success one 
activity that I put that's gotten really good reviews is this one where the teacher splits everybody into groups and presents them with this activity. You have to cut a piece of paper into different shapes and the person, the group that does it the fastest wins. But the catch is you have like disadvantages and so one group will have their hand tied behind their back, one group will be blindfolded and then one group will have no disadvantages. And what happens is the group that has no disadvantages always wins. Yeah. And when they win, you know, they'll celebrate it and they'll get a reward. And all the other people will say, like, that's really unfair because they won. Yes. But like, look at what we did. We had like our hand tied behind our back and we came up with this really ingenuitive way of cutting this. And we used our creativity and we worked really hard. And, and they'll kind of phrase it that way. And they'll be like, we should get some reward for the effort that we put in, even though we didn't win. Like we, we put a lot of time into this and we thought it through and like we showed different skills. Yeah. And then the teacher will say, like, that's exactly what it feels like to be neurodiverse. Yes, you may not get 100% on the spelling test like everyone else did, but you put in the time and you came up with all these different ways. Like I remember I'll be practicing my spelling tests like on the bus, in the car. I had like my Quizlet before anybody else had Quizlet, like all that stuff. And then you feel like, it comes to nothing because everyone else kind of wins and they get a higher score even though they'll brag about not putting any effort in. And you feel like I should get some kind of acknowledgement for the effort, Mm. but it's a school system that prioritizes, you know, the end result. Yeah. And if you're not getting that high grade or if you're not getting the results that everyone else is, a lot of the time they assume it's because you're lazy. And I remember, you know, being eight years old and my parents going into meetings and being told, Sienna is really lazy and she doesn't try hard. My parents were like, what do you mean? Why, why do you think that? And they would say, well, here's the thing. She writes good essays. Like she writes good creative writing stories, but her grammar and her um, spelling is really bad. And so that must be because she doesn't decide to try. And she's just like, I'm not going to try to spell correctly because someone who can write a story like that is someone who can spell correctly. And so she's doing it on purpose. That's awful. And my parents would be like, who does that? Like laziness is not doing it. Laziness isn't writing a three page essay when everyone else is writing a one page essay, but having spelling mistakes in it. Like it's flawed logic, but teachers would constantly tell me that. And it was really hurtful for me because they didn't realize the amount of effort I was putting into it. It was hurtful. And so the activity kind of showcases some of those ideas and helps neurotypical children understand their neurodiverse classmates. I absolutely love that. I think that's a really great way of giving people a, a taste for what it feels like, I guess. You know, sort of the, the irony about autism is, you know, that it's, it, they, they often say that it's a difficulty sort of seeing things from other people's perspectives. Whereas what's needed for non autistic people to understand autistic people is that sort of um, shift in perspective, I guess. Which is I, f- I find quite quite funny. Like I think it's I think it's funny that 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 autism is tied to that label of not seeing things from other people's perspectives. Where it's like a two way system, isn't it? People um, don't see the perspective of an autistic person because you know they, they either don't want to put the effort into doing that, or they they just don't have the capability to do it on their own. I've definitely found that as well. Yeah, but that's um that's really. That's really interesting. I like that idea of getting people and, and giving them an experience of it. There are, I think, some things out there, um, like the autism reality experience, um, which I've sort of uh, chatted to the the, the managers and, and stuff like that, and they go around in this van. Sounds very weird. <laughs> they go around in this van, and it's it's basically like a they put the headphones on, and they've got a lot of strobe flashy lights, and they basically try to overload a non-autistic person, or at least give them a, an experience of what sensory processing difficulties are like. And then they get them to do tasks, and they sort of compare not being overloaded with being overloaded. I mean, it sounds like quite a good way of sort of translating um, experiences to another person. A lot of people, they'll kind of see individuals who are autistic 
and think like, oh, you know, this person might be making eye contact with me. Or like this person is kind of holding a conversation. And I'll be like, well, you can't really have that many struggles. And people tell me that all the time. They're like, how are you autistic? You just gave a speech. Stuff like that. And mm. it just shows that they don't really understand the experience. It's also because you, you, you're quite a strong, a strong person to be able to sort of push yourself to do to do all of those things. So I can I can empathize to to a certain extent with sort of pushing through those difficult and grand things that require a lot of a lot of attention and, and concentration and sort of stress management. So it's I think it's it's also because you're achieving as well. Like you're you're achieving more than more than the average person. So people don't see the difficulties. They only see like the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. With the laziness. When I was sort of going up the talent pathway in in the Taekwondo sort of world, when I was sort of going to these events, there was a particular instance where I was going to this training session with the GB uh, national team. The, The person who was sort of overseeing the event was a very decorated Taekwondo athlete and someone that I think everybody in the Taekwondo world sort of aspired to be like. And because I had sort of like a meltdown before the training camp and it it took me a while to sort of feel comfortable enough to train properly, they actually pulled my coach to the side and said that I was too lazy and I was unmotivated. It was the, it was the biggest, most heart-wrenching insult that I've ever got because that was like the only thing that I felt like I had over other people that I wasn't lazy and I, I, I pushed through difficult things. And I guess when you were telling me that, you know, that story of people sort of calling you lazy and, and all that kind of stuff, it, it sort of reflected a little bit in sort of my experiences with that as well. Yeah, I know. And it really does like have an effect on you just long term because I'll be doing stuff. And I remember I was at, I was doing an internship and um, everyone else was like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go get lunch. And so they all went to go do that. And I was like, I've got to stay here because they'll think I'm lazy. If I, if I like go, they'll think I don't have a work ethic because I, I couldn't understand why those teachers had thought I was lazy. And so I just kind of assumed like, oh, everyone's going to think that about me. So I've got to overcompensate even more than I'm already doing Mm. so that like there's never any kind of question about my work ethic because it it always just kind of hurt me that there are other people who maybe don't put in as much effort but because of their social skills they're able to present it in a way like they're working really hard and the teacher can see that yeah and then you have people on the other side who work really hard but because of their social presentation the teachers think oh yeah that they're the ones who aren't putting in the effort and so i was just kind of trying to emulate that behavior and i would like go online and try to figure out how to make it look like you're working incredibly hard and so i would just like sit there and and like do extra work and i would constantly like send it to the person in charge so that they knew like oh yeah at this time i was doing this thing completely overthinking it it's mad that you have to sort of resort to that I think like throughout secondary school, there's definitely been teachers that don't really get me like, and they they think that I'm being lazy and not working hard and stuff. But then there there are certain teachers that I had at school that really sort of saw the the struggle and the, the, the effort that was putting into sort of studying and all that. And those, those people were very sort of influential for me and they, they gave, they gave me a lot of support. I guess so more emotional support really because instead of sort of bashing me and and punishing me like some of the other teachers would do they would do the opposite so they would encourage me and sort of give me that emotional crutch I guess and at the one of my English teachers and my philosophy teachers were those people I guess and maybe that's why I, I've, I feel very drawn to the art of debating and, and conversation and all that. I get that um I was at this school where I was being bullied and my parents decided and I as well decided to file a disability hate crime Uh, um, and other different things at the tribunal and in doing so we filed a subject access request and what this subject access request does is um, the school has to send you 
any email, any note, anything that relates to me and has my name on it or is, I'm somehow involved in it. And I was going through all these different emails. And one of these emails was um, talking about sets and different, like, so you had your top set and your bottom set and which set I should yeah, be in yeah. for all my science subjects. And my biology teacher was like, she should be in the bottom set. She's not good at biology. She doesn't have the critical thinking skills. She, and he was, he was going on about all these skills I lacked. And he's like, she's just, she doesn't deserve to be in, 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 in a top set at all. She should be at the bottom set. Mm. And then I had another teacher who was like, who, who kind of spoke up for me and was like, there, there's no way that's not right. And so I ended up in a middle set and I didn't know that this had gone on behind the scenes um, because I was a student there when I was put in this set. Mm. And I just felt so mortified because I was an academic scholar. And when you're an academic scholar, there's like a pressure to, to achieve and to be in the top set. It's kind of embarrassing to be like in, I was in the middle set, but the bottom of the middle set. Uh, and it was, it was so mortifying so like for me. Four. Like I couldn't. Yeah, so how it worked is you had the top four sets mm -hmm. and then the bottom three sets. And the bottom three sets were actually all the same set. They just kind of randomized it. And so you had one okay. big kind of bottom set. And then you had the top four sets that were ranked. And so I was in like the fourth set. And it was so mortifying. Mm -hmm. I was like the only scholar in that set. And every time I went to class, I just was like, I had all this anxiety and I was so embarrassed. There were no words to describe. And it didn't get better throughout the year. If anything, it got worse. And I remember I loved physics so much, but I, after I found out what set I was in, I was just so embarrassed to go in. Well, I ended up leaving the school and I'm put in um, this different school and they're really, really supportive. And I'm talking to my director of studies and she's like, I think that you should take math early. So I was 14 at the time and I was like in year 10 and she was like, just do it this summer. And I'm like, I, I don't think so. Like that's I, that really. And the thing is, since I'm an August child, I was young for the year I was in. And so I yeah. was already kind of like, I don't, I don't want to do this. And she was like, really, you should do math. And so I decided I was going to do math. And then we have another conversation and she ends up convincing me to take my three sciences early and the whole time I was like I was I was in like the middle like I was in a really low set like at this other school where they knew what the thing was the school that I was at previously it was a high achieving academic school where they had a system and they had ways of getting people top grades this new school I was at it wasn't quite like that it was more of like a you do what you want and see what happens and there wasn't as much of that strategy Mm. And so I was like, maybe they don't know what they're talking about. Maybe I'm going to get like all D's and U's and it's going to be embarrassing. And it's going to, well, I end up going into the exam and I take my different tests and I felt like it went well. I'm so nervous about getting my results. I finally get them. And at 14, I got four A stars wow. in the three sciences and in the math. Wow. -y. And I remember sitting there and being like, there was this teacher who said that I deserved to be in the bottom set because I had none of these critical thinking skills. And I was so like, I didn't deserve to be a scholar and all this stuff. And I'm like, and at 14, I got, and I was, I was so proud of it. Like I, I just it's felt so like good. I'd proven everyone wrong. And it was a lot to do because I'd actually wasted a lot of year 10 because of the bullying that went on. Yes. And there was a time where like, I wasn't going to school and I had all this anxiety and I was spending, I had, um, PTSD from the like disability based hate crimes that were going on mm -hmm. and so I was spending like a lot of time in and out of different like counselors offices yeah. and just dealing with my mental health and like my sensory processing disorder got so bad that like I couldn't leave the house and so that three months leading up to my GCSEs that was the time in which I got everything together and got those grades and I'm just thinking like yeah I've got all these skills that you said I didn't have wow it's a very inspirational story. It's it's really great to hear that as well. Like it's it's like uh, sticking it to the man, isn't it? Just I don't care about your opinions. I'm going to do it now, and I'm going to do well, <laughs> like really well. That is yeah. That is absolutely amazing. Like, I'm so happy for you. Like, okay. no, it just goes to show how like some teachers get you, and other teachers just completely misunderstand what you do. Yeah, 
Exactly. And one of the things that I wanted to chat to you about is because you've taken this neurodiversity celebration week and you've tried to do all these sort of anti anti bullying campaigns and stuff. And I feel like there's a lot of commonalities between yourself and I because I, I recently released a, a documentary about autism and mental health and my sort of main things that I'm trying to tackle is mental health. I think what you were saying about education in schools for people who aren't autistic is very important because I think like autism is, is very much like a, um, it lends itself to the social model of disability rather than the medical model. So it's, it's caused by a difference as, as opposed to sort of the rest of society, I guess, rather than an actual straight disability. Yeah, I, f- I think that, that bullying and, and even in the workplace as well needs to be tackled at sort of like a young age. So there needs to be at least like a little bit of awareness of autism at a young age and sort of to normalize it so that it's it's more of a, a commonality. Because it is common. Like in every school, you're going to have at least an autistic person in, you know, every, every said year or um, in the school in, in rare cases, I guess. And you sort of do do sort of the same thing. So you're you're taking more of that neurodiversity angle, um, and sort of tackling tackling bullying as a sort of a lone thing. I know I know this is sort of a little bit late in mentioning, <laughs> but it's it's been really nice to sort of hear your stories. And could you give a little overview into what neurodiversity is and why it's important? Sure. So neurodiversity it refers to variations in the human brain. So autism, dyslexia and dyspraxia are all natural variations. And the way our society works is it kind of pathologizes these conditions and focuses on trying to cure them. My kind of neurodiversity campaign, it flips that and it focuses instead on recognizing that some of the greatest innovations have actually come from people who are neurodivergent. And being neurodivergent can really help our society. Um, If you look at like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, they're all neurodivergent and look at what they've contributed to technology and just our lives in general. And we should be focusing on promoting, empowering, encouraging neurodivergent students instead of trying to kind of push them out of education, tell them that they're lazy and they don't work hard and they don't, they shouldn't go to university and then trying to cure like millions has been spent on trying to cure autism and it's just upsetting to me because like there are a lot of people who are autistic and have contributed a tremendous amount to just like technology like if you look at like Temple Grandin she um revolutionized the like cattle industry Mm, so she yes I read a book yeah and that had a big impact um and they're just I can give countless examples of people who have because they see the world differently, are able to come up with innovations that maybe a neurotypical person wouldn't be able to come up with. And we need all kinds of different minds. Um, That's what is going to best serve society. And so this idea of like, oh yeah, we've got got to cure all of this because it's a disease, it's just upsetting to me. Yeah, and I think that's something that a lot of sort of artistic minds and the the communities on Instagram and Facebook I think as well. It, there's very much certain organisations that the autistic community sort of shuns quite a lot and those organisations tend to focus more on sort of treatment and treatment air quotation marks and uh, research sort of around like testing kits and stuff which is obviously not what we like to hear. The, the idea of neurodiversity is, is very grounded because it makes it makes sense if there is something that is so prevalent in society and it, it doesn't influence uh, f- functioning to such a, such a large extent that you can't live a normal life, then it makes sense that that was advantageous in the past. So, you know, may, maybe there is this sort of community and the people who have more neurodiverse people, for example, people with ADHD, would be 
sort of like the watchdogs, people who keep the tribe safe. They'll wake up in the flick of an eye and obviously it's, if it's a little bit more hyperactive kind of side of things, but wake up in the flick of an eye, be a bit, a lot more alert and in, in tune with what's going on and have a lot more energy to sort of play that role. So the autism side of things would be um, innovating and, and bringing things on and in, in many different areas, like not even just like STEM sciences and stuff. I think neurodiverse minds can be very influential in terms of like social progression, just because we, we can sort of have that non-biased detachment from things and, and sort of being able to view it as more of a, this is what's wrong this is how we could fix it kind of mentality, which I think, yeah, it has a lot of grounding for the, the sort of basis of neurodiversity. So you've, you've already said a little bit about why it's important in society. Do you think it's important in the workplace, like sort of the general workplace? Do you think someone having autism could benefit some work environments? So I gave a speech at this event and I was just really happy to have been invited. It was a um, diversity event at the Crick Institute and it was talking about diversity in the workforce and ordinarily they would just include someone who would talk about the importance of having women in the workforce, someone would, who would talk about the importance of having racial diversity and then someone who would talk about LGBT but they invited me along to talk about the importance of having a neurodiverse workforce. And I felt like that was a really great step forward um, in including neurodiversity in diversity initiatives. I'm a big believer that, you know, if every single person was the exact same and had the exact same skills to set, we wouldn't really accomplish anything. Yes. Like you need people. If you have a group of people who are going to design something or come up with something, you want people to be able to do different things. You want someone to be able to, you know, come up with the idea, then someone else to write the code, then someone else to market it. You need just different skill sets and different backgrounds. And if you have someone who's neurodiverse and just has a brain that people often say, you know, wired differently, someone who sees the world from a different perspective and who, you know, people who are dyslexic, for instance, have are known for having an insane amount of creativity just because you have to come up with all these different ways of getting around the differences that you have yes so i on my in my book like i've talked about these different like tips and tricks i've come up with and these ways that i've kind of overcome hurdles and when you spend your whole life doing that i have countless hours that i've dedicated to problem solving mm -hmm. and someone who's neurotypical may not have to spend you know hours of their day thinking about how they're going to use the tube because they have a yes. sensory processing disorder. <laughs> like that's not something that they would ever have to worry about. And so I have a different skill set because I spend a lot of my time, you know, focusing on stuff like that. And so if you put me in a group with a ton of people who have never experienced that before, my brain can just work through things, you know, faster sometimes. Like I remember I was in a group where we had to do like a problem solving thing and I was able to do it really quickly because I've like dedicated, there's this book I read about like 10,000 hours. It's like, if you dedicate 10,000 hours into something, you'll be an expert. Yes. I have 100% dedicated 10,000 hours into problem solving with all my learning differences and like overcoming things. So I'm an, I'm an expert in my problem solving. And, and, and it's just, you just need different perspectives. You can't have every single person on a team have the exact same skill set, do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Because why have a team? Why not have one person then? Well, I guess... Um... There, there is definitely a lot of utility in having sort of a different, different brain in any sort of situation, whether it's like in social groups or at workplaces or, you know, in companies and all that. I think having a little bit of a, as you said, like a little bit of a different angle is quite important. But again, you know, that there's the flip side of that, you know, the, we've got all these positives and stuff, but, you know, I, I came across this statistic recently about self autism in in the workplace and there are some ridiculous statistics around unemployment and even like autistic university graduates it's definitely not something that has been well integrated into workforces there's a lot of bullying that goes on that people sort of chat to me about some of my friends on instagram and, and facebook and, and all that they 
quite often tell me about sort of the, the, the bullying and the, the isolating that goes on um, in workplaces. And I guess, you know, sort of, it, it, it ties in very nicely that you're sort of doing this neurodiversity work, but you're also trying to sort of target anti-bullying. And I think it's very important to try and facilitate autistic people into the workplace as much as possible. I think it's just about convincing like managers and, and heads and stuff that putting in these placements and doing a little bit of educational work in workplaces or at schools can reap a lot of good results. It's just getting people to listen, isn't it? Yeah. So um, I know you've talked a little bit about sort of your background, sort of meaning behind your, your advocacy work. But if we look at your view for the world and, and what you would like to see enacted, what would your perfect world be for including neurodiverse individuals? Well, I remember I read this this article and it was like and it was like about changing perspective and it it talked about like if every single person had to use a wheelchair, then you wouldn't have to fight for things to be wheelchair accessible because it would just be done already. Yes. And I kind of think like if everybody understood the struggle that autistic people have just in public settings where things aren't sensory processing disorder friendly, when, you know, people just set up events and kind of create situations that are like a real nightmare for autistic individuals. If people were able to see it from our perspective and understand the effect that it has, things would just become better for us. And I believe that a lot of the struggles that I have with my autism are because other people don't understand me. Hmm. Like a lot of the issues, like it, the main problem that I describe when I talk about the downside to having autism is the anxiety that comes alongside it. Yes. But I don't think that that's inherent anxiety from my autism. I think it's just anxiety because I live in a world that hasn't been adapted in any way for us. Mm -hmm. And so if schools were to take some time and just think, you know, what would it feel like if I were incredibly sensitive to bright light and I was sitting underneath a fluorescent light? How would that feel? Like if they were to just think through it that way, then they would be like, okay, well, you know, if we have to renovate our school or something, let's not do that again. Or if I've got a student in my class who is autistic, then I just won't sit them underneath a bright light. And something like that is so minor if you're a teacher, just moving someone a seat over. But mm. that would completely change their school day. It has like really big ramifications. And so it would just, I would like to see a world in which people just try to put themselves in our shoes, see our experience and see how they can help us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, from from doing the documentary and stuff, there's this uh, character called Peter Bainbridge. He's not a character, he's a person. And he said that, the, the best people that he's found for sort of treating autistic people right sometimes have no experience with autistic people. They just genuinely listen to, to what a person has to say and tries to put things in place to make them feel better. Genuine sort of humanitarian kind of nice things that you do for other people. And I thought that was quite impactful but I guess one of the, one of the issues is is people don't really understand sort of like ASD one and Asperger's. I guess there is sort of that grey area for people. I f- I find that people either d- demonise it and say that I'm I'm not the disability or I'm I'm not it's not me like I'm separate from it, and they sort of take that angle and and demonize it a little bit and then you've got sort of the other side of things where people just uh they think that you you're exaggerating or they don't fully appreciate the extent to which you can struggle and that those are those are the two types of common things that i get when i tell people that i'm on the autistic spectrum so i think you know having people like yourself out there for people to to learn from and learn a bit more about it in terms of parents people who are autistic people who aren't 
that kind of work is priceless, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I can really relate to, you know, some of the best um, and most supportive people for like autistic individuals, people who are just kind and who listen to you. I've had Senkos who are meant to have had years of training on how to handle and how to help um, autistic individuals. And they just are really difficult to work with. And they'll be like, oh, you know, if you want this adjustment, then you need to go back to the person who diagnosed you and get them to write in the report that you need that adjustment. And it's like, so what, I have to spend another, you know, six months waiting to meet, to see this person. And another, like, if you're doing it, like, privately, like, a thousand pounds just so that someone can write a line saying don't put her near a window Ugh. like is it really that difficult this was like this was hilarious was like, like i look back on it now and i find it funny but at the time it really wasn't i had this teacher who was like everyone's a little autistic mm. and so if i gave you that adjustment so I, I asked her to sit near the front of the board because um it was to do with like dyslexia but it was also like an autism thing yeah like dyslexia to, to read the front of the board, but there was also some autism thing. Oh yeah, it was because um, the heat from the radiator, the, like the radiator was vibrating or doing, oh yeah, that was it. I could hear the electricity in the wall or something. And this was years ago. And I was like, it's really, really bothering me. And it's giving me a really bad headache. And there's like a fluorescent light thing. So can I sit near the front of the um, classroom? And there was an empty seat in the front of the classroom. And she was like, no, because everyone's a little autistic. And the only reason that you are diagnosed with autism is because your parents wanted you to be. Uh, if I wanted to be diagnosed with autism, I could easily be diagnosed with autism. Everyone's got autism. What and, is and, this and teacher? Like, and I'm like, oh my God, like, it was so crazy to me. And so I asked her for like extra time on an exam. And she's like, okay, everyone gets extra time. <sighs> and so then I went to, a t- I went to like the Senko and I was like, I didn't get extra time on the exam. And then she's like, no, everyone got extra time on the exam. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm meant to get extra time on top of everyone else's extra time. And she's like, no, you're meant to get extra time and you've got extra time. And so the teacher would do this thing where if an exam was meant to be 20 minutes, she would make it like 15 minutes and then be like, but I'm giving you five minutes extra time. And so it was, it was the weirdest thing. Ah, It was so bizarre to me. And it was like some emotional twisting or that's horrible. And then I had another teacher who did this thing where she would give me extra time but she would make everyone else wait. And so she would say, we're doing this thing in four minutes, and then Sienna gets one minute extra. And so everyone has to wait for Sienna to finish her one minute. (sighs) And so the whole class would look at me and wait for me to finish the one minute. And so then I would say, it's fine, I don't need the one minute, when I really did, just because I didn't want everyone to get mad at me. And then I went and I talked to her about it afterwards, and she was like, I gave you the extra time, you just didn't take it. And I'm like, no, but it's the way you gave it to me. Well, if you really needed it, you would have taken it. And I'm like, that's just, you're not listening to me. And then I had other teachers who were just so supportive. And I'm like, I need extra time. And they didn't even ask me like, oh, you know, why do you, like, there was no like interrogation mm. over like which learning disability I was using to get my extra time. It was just like, okay, like you have a report that says you need it. Like the Senko told me you need it. So you get your extra time. It's absolutely fine. And they would be like, oh, just come into class early. So that then, like, there's no drama with people having to wait. I'm like, okay, awesome. Like, and, and it was so easy. And I feel like the teachers who made life difficult for me also made their own lives difficult because it's just a pain to have to deal with, like, giving me this whole monologue about how I'm not autistic and then having to, like, send emails to the Senko and have meetings and meet mm. my parents. Whereas if they just moved me, it would be, it would be over with in a second. Yeah. And so I just, I don't know what people. I think some people who are sort of trained and, and have experience with autism, they they obviously learn quite a lot about sort of like the traits and stuff. But I found that some people can get like worse from from having that training because they just have such solidarity of, of how they think autistic people should be that it's difficult for you to convince them or, or at least you know, have them appreciate how you may be different to the other people that they've encountered. And they can sort of be a bit sort of harsh, I guess, just within sort of the ASD kind of one category. Like pe- even, even with that crossover, people just seem to get so confident in their their knowledge of it 
that they just disregard what you're saying. I know. And people come up with their own definitions of different neurodiversity sometimes, which makes no sense to me. Like I had a teacher who thought that dyspraxia just meant like you weren't Olympic level good at sport. And so this like sport teacher was explaining to me, just because you're like not top set, it doesn't mean you have a disability. Mm. I'm like, the reason I got diagnosed wasn't because I'm top set. The meaning of the reason I got diagnosed is because I'm like t- 10 years old and I'm still like tripping and li- like leaving a mess everywhere <laughs> because I can't organize things. And like, I can't, I remember when I was getting diagnosed for um, dyspraxia, I couldn't catch a ball. They, they, did, they do this test where they throw a ball at you like 20 times and then they like count how many times you catch it. Mm-hmm. And then from there, they like create like a little percentage and then they like they use it to diagnose you. And I remember I think they threw it 20 times and I didn't catch it once. And I, I put effort into it. Like I was really trying to catch it because I didn't want to be like embarrassed by the fact that I couldn't catch this ball. And I'm like, that's a problem. That's not being like top set and being upset because I'm not top set. But this teacher had kind of categorized dyspraxia in that way. And it just, it, it bothers me. And it, it doesn't really make sense to me because like, why would you be that dismissive of like an eight-year-old? who's like telling you like you know this is the situation that i have there was one thing that i wanted to ask you and obviously with any sort of mission to change things in society you know it's, it's quite a big task and so what are some of the the barriers that could be a problem and how can we overcome those barriers in trying to promote neurodiversity trying to promote neurodiversity and trying to promote Talk about anti-bullying and, and autism awareness and stuff. Um, I mean, you you encounter a lot of people who are very fixed in their way, and they know nothing about like neurodiversity, or the little that they do know is completely wrong. But mm-hmm. they're so fixed in it that they'll come up to you and like tell you stuff like, you know, you're not autistic. I'm like, oh okay, because you're a girl. Ugh. girls can't be autistic no and way like, that's just so does that wrong. still happen that's not even like yeah it still happens and it's not even like debatable it's not like we could sit there and like have a little discussion over it it's like just wrong like so thoroughly wrong and and a lot of people think that you know with like dyslexia and dyspraxia especially adhd adhd is a big one mm-hmm. that it doesn't actually actually exist it's just middle class parents not parenting their kids properly and their kids ending up being like rowdy and hyper and then them being like, oh, we're embarrassed by this. Let's get them diagnosed with something. Oh, it's such a toxic way of viewing it. But like a lot of people feel that way. And from my perspective, like my story about getting diagnosed with ADHD was I was 15. I'd been in the neurodiversity kind of space mm-hmm. for years at that point. I'd heard a lot about ADHD, but felt like I didn't have it because I wasn't that hyperactive that it's associated with it. Yeah. Do you have more of the sort of inattentive form? Yeah. And I that hadn't been advertised as much. Like when you think of ADHD, you think of more the hyperactive. <laughs> you don't think of it. And so I was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't believe I have that. And then I was just having a really difficult time focusing. I'd already done all of my GCSEs that I enjoyed, like the physics and the math and all of that that I can hyper focus on. And now I was dealing with stuff that I didn't have an interest in like like English and all that and I was just having such a difficult time focusing and it got to a point where I felt like this isn't normal Mm -hmm. um like there's something that is off and I'd explained it away with like my autism and like oh well you know maybe it's just not working out and but then I went online and I was like actually this ADHD like this inattentive ADHD it's exactly what I've had and I've had it for years well I've had it my whole life but like I've been like I could have been diagnosed at any age if someone had, or even myself, had just like properly read what inattentive ADHD was. And I, I ticked all the boxes. And so when people say like, oh yeah, you just have ADHD because your parents trying to explain your bad behavior. That's, that's not what happened. I got myself diagnosed, mm-hmm. you know, and to make those assumptions, it can be incredibly offensive because it's kind of saying like, well, you don't have this. Yeah. And it's difficult to reason with them when you know, you're sitting there and you're like, this is something that be- has become a really large part of my identity. Like I spend the majority of my time talking about my autism, my ADHD, my dyslexia, my dyspraxia. Like it's something that I see as like a cornerstone of like who I am, my personality and what makes me me. And so when you're having this conversation with someone who's just saying like, there's no way that you have these 
differences, just a bit off-putting. But you've just got to ignore it and focus on the people who, you know, want to listen, want support, and want to listen and, and to hear what you have to say. Yeah, definitely. I think that there are a lot of barriers to um, achieving those changes. As I think at that sort of more personal level, it makes sense that you are going to come across people who just they don't really care or they they, they don't fully appreciate what you're saying to them. But then again, there are people who do, and those people, they can be the people who lift you lift you further towards your goal, which is great. I think one of the challenges that I've found is we've got a wealth of knowledge and, and experience and great sort of neurodiversity autism advocates on like Instagram and Facebook and, and stuff like that. There's a lot of people doing some really great work. Um, even on YouTube, but it never really seems to enter the mainstream. And that's one thing that I was trying to sort of achieve with my my recent documentary. Like it's it's so hard. It's so hard to get it to get things seen about autism. Like it's we need people to be on news programs and TV programs so that people have a have a good idea of what autism is. It needs to have some precedent in the mainstream because there's there's a significant amount of the population who are autistic, even in the UK. And although that is one percent, that's still like upwards of you know one or two percent rather. It's still upwards of like seven hundred thousand people at the sort of bare minimum. And it's important to try and include those people in society. I just think a lot of the um, the typically negative traits and stuff of autism can can make it hard to it can make it hard to want to connect with people and and talk to people when your whole life has just been a sequence of traumatic social events it's like why would you want to be a part of the society and and there's a lot of people who think that as well it's just it's just hard isn't it you've got to keep trying as much as you can and try new things and hopefully something will stick and Obviously, you've you've made a good impact, a very good impact in in terms of your public speaking and your and your work and and your book and it's all really amazing, great stuff. I'm ve- I'm very humbled to be talking to someone who's made such a already made such a massive impact. Thank you. No worries. Like you, you deserve all the praise that I can that I can give you. <laughs> so I'm sort of leading up to the end of the the podcast. Would you like to give us three main things that you want people to take away from it? Okay, so I would say, um, you know, if you are neurotypical, just be supportive of the neurodiverse community around you. Um, If people are asking for adjustments, just like listen to them. I would also say that don't make assumptions. There's this quote that I kind of like, and it's like, if you've met one autistic person, that means you've met one autistic person. People kind of like to generalize and think like, oh, I met this one individual who was very sensitive to touch and bright lights and they were autistic. And so I know what the autistic experience is because I've met this one person. And so then when I meet another person yeah. who is autistic, I can apply what I've learned. And I think that that's wrong. With dyslexia, I feel like if you were to line up 100 people who were dyslexic and ask them about their experiences, they would all say a very similar thing, like talk about spelling and talk about reading, and that would be their experience. We all share that. But within the autistic community, there's a lot of variation and it is a spectrum. And so if you try to apply lessons that you've learned from one individual, it may not work out as well. You should just listen to what this person is saying and make the adjustments that they're asking you to instead of make adjustments that worked with someone else and just be open and then I would also say if you are neurodiverse just know that your differences are advantageous and like there may be times where you feel really down and it's really difficult and you're overcoming a lot of hurdles and people aren't being supportive but just know that like if you're confident with who you are and you put yourself in a position where you're in spaces where people support you, even though that is hard to do, I like recognize that, 
all the problems that you're currently having will dissipate over time if you're kind of conscious of the differences you have and you're supportive of those differences and you make sure to make little adjustments in your life and just increase your confidence um that's what i've found so just yeah know that that you're awesome very good thank you very much for that um we have the last question which i try to ask every autistic person who comes on to the podcast what does autism mean to you sienna um I feel like the way I would have answered this question would drastically change over the years. <laughs> um, when I was, you know, going through my bullying, I would have probably given a very negative answer and I would have talked about how like, oh, it's all these difficulties and, and all these challenges. But if I look back, the challenges I was having weren't really to do with my autism. They were just due to toxic people. And I want to separate that. Because like, if I look at my autism and, and just that, not the way that other people have interacted with me or the way the world has set up that has made me upset. Like if I just look at my autism, I can only think of positive. It's given me a different perspective on life. It's made me more kind of considerate of other people and what other people are going through. It's helped me with my math ability, which is the biggest passion of mine. And I don't know who I would be if I didn't like enjoy math the way I do. It's just given me a lot of passion and a lot of the reason why, you know, I work as hard as I do with like my neurodiversity campaign is to help other people and to make the world a more inclusive, supportive space. And if I weren't autistic, I don't know what I would be doing with my life. I don't feel like I would be trying to help people as much because a lot of the reason why I try to help people is because of what I've gone through. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it makes me who I am. And so I can only say positive things at this time in my life. Negative life experiences can be absolutely horrible, but there is always a way of turning every negative into a positive. I guess with you, it's it's that you were bullied and you had a tough time at school. Um, and so you've, you've used those experiences and you used that, that drive to improve things, to try and improve things for other people who are going through the same thing. It's one of one of the most honourable and wonderful things that someone can do. I think it's 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 very brave to to face those and sort of process them and try and improve them and, and work around things for other people. I guess it must it must bring a lot of meaning and um, light to your life. Yeah, it it does, and it it just makes me when I get emails from people saying, you know. I read your book or I read this post that you did and it's completely changed my life and my perspective on myself. It, it, it makes me feel like what I'm doing has a purpose and it's helping people. And it's just very fulfilling when you hear about people that were going through the exact same struggle that I went through. Mm-hmm. But because of advice that I'm given, are able to have a different outcome that's more positive. It's just really empowering for me. That's brilliant. Sienna, would you like to give out some links um to like your website and your book and and all that uh, just for anybody who wants to sort of follow up this podcast episode and check out some of the stuff that you've been doing okay um so so you can follow me on twitter at, at qr mentoring um you can go on to qrmentoring.com um to read articles that i've done and you can go on to siennacastellon.com and from there, you can get signed copies of my books. You can also get um, a pin that says, I support neurodiversity. Very cool. And I will put those links as well as anything else that you uh, fancy sharing in the description, as always. Just to give a few little links of myself out, um, you can always follow me on my social medias, at Asperger's Growth, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. YouTube, if you want a little more of a, a video style approach to the autism and mental health things that we discuss, um, I think we've got a few things on on neurodiversity on the Asperger's Growth channel if you want to go check that out. And of course, you can always find the 40 OT podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So there's a lot of different ways of listening to these amazing people like Sienna talk about um, what they're passionate about and talk about their stories and, and their motives in life. And if you do want to go check out the documentary, it's still out there. It's just passed about 
4.5 thousand views, which I'm so grateful for. It's called Asperger's in Society, and you can find that on the Asperger's Growth Channel or aspergersinsociety.com. Sienna, thank you so much for coming on to talk about your experiences and, and your thoughts on neurodiversity. It's been very, very nice to hear your, your stories and very interesting. Thank you. I really enjoyed being here and talking with you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the 40 Oti podcast. I definitely think you should go check out Sienna's new book, especially if you are currently at school and you are on the autism spectrum yourself. If not, it can be read by anyone. I found it very insightful into the into the life of autistic girls, because obviously I'm an autistic male, so it's a little bit different in some aspects, but it was great to hear about and learn. And uh, possibly in the future, if I decide to have any kids, and one of them is a neurodiverse girl, um, I think a lot of the things that Sienna has brought up in her book could be very applicable to me understanding my daughter, said so daughter. I don't have a daughter. <laughs> in a hypothetical world. <laughs> Very interesting. Definitely recommend you go see it. Have you enjoyed your experience on the podcast? Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. You're really great to talk to. I'm so great to hear that. I'm so great to hear that. I'm so honoured to hear that. I think um, it's definitely taken me a while to, to get to this level of uh, competency with talking. Um, I still sort of stumble over my words a little bit, but I, pre- I appreciate you coming on. Of course, yeah, everybody, stay bright, stay fresh. Maybe this episode will be coming out when COVID is all over. Um, If not, I hope that these episodes fill your days with um, something interesting to talk about. And always make sure that you stay safe, social distance, keep yourself clean, all that good stuff. Try and keep the country going. And hopefully we'll be out of this ridiculous situation that we find ourselves in. That's all from me. I'm Thomas Henley from the 40 OT podcast and hope you have a good day. See you later, folks. Bye, guys. Um, I should really start briefing people on like saying bye at the end because it's something that happens a lot. I think there's only been like a couple of people who've done it. <laughs> it's right? No, it's like it's hard to do because like each show has a different like etiquette and like with some shows. You just have to like be quiet while the host is talking, and then with others, it's like more interactive, and so it's hard to just figure out what <laughs> what to do. It's a learning process, but I'm I'm getting better at it. I also don't know when to finish podcasts as well. I really struggle. I'm trying to think of some ways of exiting the podcast in a in a flamboyant way, but nothing's come up yet. So a good old bye does does its job. No, it's good. <laughs> Thanks for listening.